This is a pop-up OGM call on Friday, October 16th, 2020. It is, what, 17 or 19 days to the election? Something just crazy like that? Absolutely crazy like that? And that's a little bit, uh, we got our ballots in the mail yesterday and filled them out and seal them and we're going to drop them in our building's mailbox today and we also have methods of checking that they were received and all that. So we signed up for all of that, got, uh, got ready for the whole thing, but it felt good. It felt good to make little dots. And, and methods, go ahead. Methods of checking is like the register or how did you do that? Uh, they, there's a slip that comes with the ballot that says to check to see whether we received it and whether it was counted, go sign up at this, you know, government website. Um, and, and so we got immediate acknowledgement that the ballot had been sent to us because we received it. Uh, so as soon as they get it back, we should get another acknowledgement or something like that. Huh. Hey, Pete. Hey, Klaus. Here in Minnesota, the lines are kind of crazy. Yeah, at the I'm on. Tables too. Mm -hmm. You're talking is, about. Is my voice? Is um, my voice okay? Your voice is now clear. Yes. It's better. Yeah. Mm hmm. You want to recite a poem or something so we can test it more? <laughs> can explain that image. Um, <laughs> that's an awfully big Yoda. Network. Hopefully, this. Uh, hopefully, the voice at least works. Yes, Klaus. Are you not in your usual spot? No, no. I'm on the Oregon coast, which has terrible internet. They didn't design it for good internet. What do you want? Coastline or internet? I mean, you know, we have that's, choices to, choices to make in the world. That's right. <laughs> um, cool. I will change to a more peaceful background. Uh, so, so I invited this call because um, we have a workshop coming up, and I think we're we're making an interest, a really interesting and valuable effort to pull together uh, what it is we all think uh, uh, that OGM might be and do. And I think it's a, it's a good and noble cause. And how might we sort of organize to do that? And we've already, uh, in the call that preceded this one, we've already tackled the document that we've got shared. Um, and so we've got a bunch there. And yesterday, you heard the description of uh, Matt's design for the workshop. And I posted that document for comments, which got a, some comments. So I wanted to kind of start with um, just taking a breath and saying, how do you feel about the workshop design? Um, what are we missing, if anything? Uh, and then dive into some of, the, some of the questions. But let me just pause for a second and see what's, uh, how anybody's feeling about what the, what the prospects are for this design. I find it impossible to understand workshop designs with bullet points. So I, I, I'll, I'll show up and see what makes sense and I'll read it. But, you know, bullet points are like, it's like a trapeze and I keep falling down to the next one and I miss them. You know, it's just these bullets, I, I, I find hard to make sense of. Maybe bullets are to you as digital clocks are to me. I discovered, I haven't worn a wristwatch in a really long time, but I discovered yeah. I, discovered I could look at the time and then look back at my work and completely have forgotten what time it was. And it mm. took me a long time to realize that I used to remember the angle of the, of the, of the hands of the clock on an analog right. clock face. And that, 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 that would persist in my, in my mind. So I could, I could sort of go, Oh, right. 10 to 10 or something like that. And, and just glancing at numbers, unless I figured out some other way to kind of tag it or mark it, just like flushed right through the buffers. That's why I chose the old clock face model on my digital watch. Mm. I'm, I have the same experience. It's just, I don't want to see a string of numbers. I want to see the clock face. Mm. And, yet, and yet we're of the generation where there were analog clock faces and we carried wristwatches and we learned to do that, right? We conditioned ourselves that the angles meant anything at all because it's a weird way to think about a day. <clears throat> I have that with Alexa too. Um, asking her the time mm. and hearing it spoken is different than, and, and better usually than better. Saying better okay. than digital yeah yeah i live in switzerland i'm surrounded by clocks with faces <laughs> ah, yeah. everywhere can't get away from them <laughs> the time that i would yeah. pay attention to a clock face is wondering when the when that period would be over in school oh. <laughs> and also living in a 
living surrounded by churches and church bells uh, every mm. quarter hour. Mm -hmm. You don't have mm. to look. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, I was writing what I was writing yesterday evening because my sense is very uh, similar to the one that Kevin just expressed. I have a really hard time looking at uh, line item steps and, and uh, creating a story in my head uh, around that concept, you know, and I have to have a story to function. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and so I've been, <clears throat> I've been working for the last eight years since my retirement on constructing a story centered around food. <clears throat> and, and I have come to, to, you know, the conclusion that food is on, on par with the energy system. You know, we, we cannot possibly regenerate uh, uh, our way back to, to a future unless we, unless we have a way to, first of all, take, stop putting carbon into the atmosphere and then taking a lot of it out, gigatons out, and the only practical way of doing that is to put it into the soil. And the only way that works is by changing the agricultural practices for a number of reasons beyond carbon sequestration. Mm -hmm. And I think we have reached a precipice you know, in the food system where the destruction of, of soil and the destruction of environmental ecosystem, of ecosystems that support agriculture is so severe you know, that there really are just a few years left. Mm -hmm. and, and it takes a few years to convert the food systems uh, into something else. So I see this as truly an existential crisis. And, and uh, uh, I I'm, I'm, I'm mean, I'm um, having looked at this for, for some time, I'm just terrified to, to see uh, us continue to drift without really, uh, really uh, uh, acting on this. So two things, Klaus. One, in solidarity for what you're saying, here's a, a, an aerial picture of a farmer who did this sculpture with his crop uh, mm. re recently. And I don't think this is Photoshop. I think this is an actual thing. But Build Back Better, there's this tractor right there. Um, and so that. And then the second thing is. Um, That's totally a crop circle. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It was made by aliens. <laughs> made by aliens who wanted to build the earth back better and are waiting for us to right. extinguish ourselves. Um, it's, it's, it's a cookbook. It's a cookbook. Um, so the second thing I want to say is, OGM is not specifically about uh, energy or about the food system or about whatever, but, but many of us, including me, are extremely passionate about what you just said. So what is, I'm interested in, in each of us, what we think the relationship is between specific issues and OGM. So, so how, does, how does rescuing the food system, improving the food system fit into what OGM does and how we do it? I'll Judy. offer an oversimplified viewpoint. Awesome, because, just as long as it's not in a bullet point. And I agree with the word piece about things and I really like Neil's diagrams because they're easier to conceptually understand as well as see where other things drift. But I see OGM as the massive umbrella mm -hmm. or the center of the pod from which extend lots of different dimensions. And they may be specific contextual ones like agriculture or earth renewal or sea renewal or air quality or education or arts in science, or they're just an infinite number of areas that are all part of OGM as society evolves and we with it will decide collectively what the most important ones are for our survival <laughs> and there will be more people flocking to try to fix those problems just as right now there are more people flocking to fix COVID mm -hmm. instead of other medical issues. So I see OGM as encompassing really encompassing all of it, encompassing the content, but also encompassing the wise wherefores and, and, and sort of visionary structures, and also encompassing the pragmatic execution. Mm -hmm. It involves people at very many different levels, many of whom are gonna choose to participate in one of what I would call the pods or spokes or something, because their expertise 
is a combination of technology and milk production mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. So that's why I see it like a huge dandelion with all these dendrites in so many different directions that there needs to be some organizational capacity to go between the levels of bigness to see the mm -hmm. uniting common threads that are essential to virtually all of it, communication, um, good hearted people, you know, capabilities and so forth. So it's very three dimensional and that makes it harder to represent on a, on a piece of paper. Does levels of bigness map to what Neil calls sort of the vertical integration of it? Okay, uh, Charles then George. I would just chime in. Um, I had I had a bit of a, a conversation with Neil earlier, um, and, and we've we've touched on this uh, in the, in the OGM sessions as well in regard to communication channels and platforms, and also knowledge repository. And I don't have one sort of specific statement or question there, but just pointing to em to emphasize the importance of of those things. You know, however that's going to happen. What what Judy just said. Um, it, it's going to have, it has to happen with, with communication within channels and platforms, whatever those are, they have to be common enough to, to actually have connectivity um, and it has to grow in the garden. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Charles. Go ahead, George. So the, the umbrella metaphor is very um, seductive. The only problem with it that there are hundreds of umbrellas that want to be the center of everything so that each of these umbrellas uh, imagines itself as the center of the universe at least the center of the planetary universe so that all the other things come under it and uh, that's a good thing because uh, that just means it's a reflection that uh, there are more and more people recognize the need for uh, some kind of integration. The challenge, which is the challenge in itself, is a good thing because it will oh, there you are. it I'm will on. help. The call was great. Right. Never mind. I just muted him. It will help us grow the capability that we don't have yet now, which is seeing all these uh, integrative hubs as an ecosystem of hubs. And if it is an ecosystem, then the next uh, kind of uh, interesting inquiry question that uh, what is the distinctive gift of each niche in that ecosystem in which we are, OGM is one of the niches. What is our specific contribution to the larger ecosystem of integrative hubs? And if we are looking at this way, then uh, I see that what we need and what we have is um, sufficient commonality, which is uh, everybody is longing for and working for a more beautiful world that our heart knows possible. That's a sufficient commonality. And what are the complementary differences? So the complementary difference comes from the unique composition of this group the unique composition that uh, none of the other umbrellas have the same mix of people, the same mix of talents, histories of relationships, resources, and uh, but taking that into account, um, we may be able to uh, listen for the evolutionary purpose not to define what our purpose should be. That's my only contribution to the uh, overall design and the workshop, 
that uh, I think we should not aim for defining what is the purpose, because it will change uh, as we are getting more uh, educated about the situation that itself keeps evolving. But uh, what we can do is sensing our group that is already large enough, it's not only the people who are here, that group, this group is already large enough to think of it as an ecosystem inside of a much larger ecosystem. And if so, then uh, given our talents and intelligences and resources and intellectual histories and orientations, given all that, what can be the most distinctive, uh, unique uh, contribution to the overall evolutionary process. And the only other things that I would uh, like to add to what I just said, that um, when we sense into, listen for, to discover the evolutionary purpose, uh, a good place to take into uh, consideration the generator impetus, where this uh, initiative came from. And uh, it seems to me that it is Jerry's brain. And uh, Jerry is a multifaceted person, just like all of us. But uh, one of the characteristic that uh, she has, and I feel that many of us shares, is a love for um, collective knowledge, collective capabilities, growing collective intelligence. Uh, and if this is one of the, if, if, if this is part of our DNA, our collective DNA, I would say, that doesn't mean that each of us has to have the very same, it just means that we as a group, uh, that's one of our strengths. And if this is one of the strengths, this can be possibly the foundation for the complementary difference from the other, other umbrellas. This can be also the gift that we bring to all the other umbrellas or uh, competences, talents, some expertise, some resources in building collective intelligence. Why it is needed? Uh, well, uh, we need to, that doesn't mean that we have it all. It just means that we have some uh, readiness for uh, creating the frameworks, tools, methods, conditions necessary for mutual learning across the various uh, movements, initiatives, projects for civilizational renewal. I'd, I'd like to riff on like five things you said, George. That was really super, super useful. Thank you. Um, one is that I've been describing OGM as a container, as a vessel, as a place with, that could hold different kinds of things. Pete was suggesting an umbrella uh, which we just brought up here. And then another, another version of umbrella is a tent. You know, everybody talks about the big tent, which is generally used in politics. Um, and I, I like those. Uh, but originally when thinking about OGM, uh, we were using a whole bunch of ecosystem metaphors. I, I talked about uh, OGM being an estuary and also being a mycelial network. And then I think the mycelial an analogy works really, really nicely for what you just said, because I think I told the story many calls ago that, um, trees are not really good at getting minerals out of the ground. Uh, fungi are really good at getting minerals out of the ground. Fungi are not very good at getting sugars out of anything. Trees are really good at that. So there's an exchange in the root system. There's basically, you know, a peer trading that goes on between what the mushroom was good at doing and what the tree was good at doing. And together they, you know, uh, basically swap out the kinds of things they need to thrive. And that, I, and I'm, I'm dramatically oversimplifying a really complicated part of nature because there's lots of other things going on. But, but those kinds of exchanges where the mycelium, uh, I'll just say, knows what it's good at or becomes more aware of what it's good at so that it can do more, more good mycelial work, I think would be really, really cool. So I, I really appreciate that. 
And then the idea that our purpose is emergent, I love, because I think we're going to discover it. It'll, it will unfold in front of us as we sort of, as we pick a target and say, that's a good statement of where we're aiming. We're going to discover as we approach it that, that it has to morph or it's going to morph or, or its need has morphed or something like that. And I think that, that emergent purpose or evolutionary purpose is a really, really lovely uh, thing to do. And then the last thing is about our, you know, what, what, what might our purpose head toward and to look at sort of the, the genesis of it. Um, the, the first group of people we invited into the conversation were a mix of uh, techno geeks who love visualizations, explanations, and visual analysis. So brain, Kumu, Miro, other stuff. <clears throat> and then a, a bunch of people who care very deeply about facilitation, presencing, human scale stuff. Uh, and, if, and, and some of those, some of the geekier people also cared a lot about reliable, distributed, linked, contextualized data. Um, and th those, that, that was kind of the, the original mix. And, and a piece of the original mission was, wouldn't it be nice if it was an open, collaborative, brain-like thing? But that, but that quickly opened up into the brain is just one of many kinds of visualizations. And unless we learn to trust each other again, we're never going to use any of this visualization for any good anyway. And then storytelling became a really big part of it because many of us, I think, realized that it isn't so much the, the, the bulletproof logical argument that we make that's going to convince anybody. It's taking somebody by the hand. It's telling a story. It's, you know, it's extremely personal uh, and much more emotional than, uh, than I think uh, we think it is. So, Judy. Mm -hmm. You are muted, alas. Um, my clock was timing. I'm sorry, I, I think umbrella was really the wrong word because I see this as a hub, but I also see it as a progressive hub, not a singular hub. I mean, there is a perhaps singular hub, but as this dandelion starts to become wholly dendritic, I see an OGM hub thing in each of the dendritic cores so that it becomes really complexly interdimensional and allows each hub to grow as it should grow, um, but with the facilitation and the sense of heart and united purpose that has characterized our discussions of OGM. And I know that's pretty idealistic, but, but I um, think if we think of ourselves not as a fixed hub, but as a caravan hub or a, you know, a hub throwing seed hubs in lots of different directions and allowing those hubs to be somewhat specialized by the needs of the particular dandelion that's growing there, um, then it becomes catalytic, which is what I think is the essence of what might be our superpower. Well, uh, one way of interpreting that is that there's kind of a, 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 a tools and ideas contagion across the different movements, across the various umbrellas. And so for, for instance, pyragogy, uh, which Charles has been, has been involved in a lot, is a complete near neighbor a community of people who have a whole series of things they've been working on springing from Howard Rheingold's work on virtual communities, online communities, and how to do that better. I, I've known Howard forever. I'm just thrilled to figure out how do we and they do this better. And the kinds of things I think we could bring to Pyragogy is let's instrument it so that it's at hand for anybody who's trying to do group process and is trying to do you know, things like that. That's, that seems to me to be like an, an, easy end, an easy opening, an easy entry, so that it's not, so that the knowledge isn't trapped inside of a PDF file, for example, or even HTML pages that are kind of lonely, but not linked and connected. So something like that seems like a, a, an opening salvo. Um, George, uh, Romer, nice to see you. Um, uh, so off to Charles. Um. Well, so you set me up just to give a nod to the lineage uh, that, uh, that George actually had acknowledged in some of his opening comments, some of the documents, which is Douglas Engelbart um, and the knowledge repository or the dynamic knowledge repository. And maybe what we're looking at is a federation of knowledge repositories. Or knowledge garden. I mean, Jack Park has been working on this for a really long time. There's a whole bunch of us that are sort of thinking about a fed, some kind of a federated knowledge space where even yeah. knowledge is not a great word to use there. But, but I think you, you mentioned pedagogy and, and the, the Kiko Lab, the Collective Intelligence Collaboratory, are a right. couple that are working on our knowledge repositories. And if each of us, including for sure OGM, you know, sort of tends to our gardens, then we can start to, to connect them up. 
Awesome. Um, uh, Mr. Jones and then Klaus. Yeah, I'm thinking about the network architecture that Judy suggested <clears throat> of a hub or even a module of a hub that gives a part to the other nodes in the network. And, you know, I think of a, a couple of things. I mean, you know, DISA does that, and that's that kind of network where it's a little thing that enables a bunch of transactions and your bank can be on top of it. Uh, mitochondria does the same thing in every cell. It's a foreign entity <clears throat> and it extracts a VIG, you know, to give you oxygen and it takes some of the food. Uh, when we built SOCAP, we built it so that, and the Coyota Commons was such a total failure uh, they, when they tried to export it. It became, yes. I don't know what, it, it, you know, they had bullet points and, 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 and plans for, for, for conquest. Can I, can I briefly, can I briefly interject? So yeah. a, friend, a friend of mine was in the middle of a Curatic Alliance. One of their problems, I think a huge part of the problem was that for any new client, they made them sign a contract up front for what they were going to do before they had ever developed any relationship, before they had any mm. aversion to anything. And so they were yeah. basically putting the cart way before the horse. And they just, they just and that, that's the only thing I know was broken about it, but it sounded extremely mm. broken. Sorry, back right. to you. Colonizer thinking. Well, anyway, when we built SOCAP, there, there were a lot of bigger events with people with more credibility. But we went to everybody and said, you know, what would make yours a little better? And we gave them all a little bit and they started camping out on ours. And we were this hive of other things without being the center. And I think <clears throat> what we're doing with friends and family funding for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle seems to be the same kind of thing, the thing we talked about yesterday. That, there are all these debt funds that, that are trying to reach African-American entrepreneurs, but they don't need debt. They need something like equity that gives you a deduction coming in and this revenue stream. So you can find the little things that complete the ecosystem, you know, like the mitochondria. I mean, we're a multi-cell organism because we agreed on a transactional relationship with mitochondria in all of our cells. Yep, exactly. And the mitochondria are symbiotic uh, bacteria that got sucked into our cells to help create energy. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I was thinking that one way to, to consider this uh, kind of hub idea is community because we are, we are building and supporting community, but I, I mean now actual community, you know, population groups uh, like Kevin is focusing on, for example, and they have multiple needs. They have needs in form of energy, of housing, of food, and so on. And the, 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 the problem with thinking about just hub or, or what it would be the purpose of hub is a form of synchronization you know, because between between these different systems there must be connectivity that that has to have a common purpose so the system drifts into a common direction i don't know if i explain this uh, uh, properly here but when, when we build food for example Food is everywhere, right? Every community, whether you build a hospital or a theme park or whatever it is, there's a food component as part of that because that's at the core of our needs. And so I see that, um, I see that the, the I'm, I'm looking more for an outcome-based definition of, of what OGM is, is, is working towards, if that makes sense. I'm sorry, it's a little chopped up here, but uh, I'm, I, I, I hope I'm directionally explaining what I'm what I'm thinking. We're all just thinking out loud here, and I really appreciate it. Um, so I think that made sense, Romer, and then back to Judy. We're getting really bad feedback. <laughs> uh, we can't hear. Now you're muted. But when you unmuted, there was like really bad feedback and I can't figure out from where. <clears throat> Try unmuting again. Okay, you're... Hmm. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And okay. You no longer, and you no longer sound like you're being held captive in a Klingon spaceship. So that's really good. <laughs> I don't know what happened here. Oh, but yes. we are getting an echo still. So there, there is still a reverb, but go ahead. We can hear you now. Okay. Well, uh, certainly uh, I see OGM as a bridge that we are still building on it as we cross over it. But the question here is, what do we bridge here? So in a bigger context, what I see is we're bridging humanity with 
the resources that they will be needing in order to uplift their lives. And as mentioned by uh, most of you, these resources is finite. It's like in a container. We have knowledge, we have technology, we have some other type of resources and it's finite. And we're dealing with like close to an infinite needs of the society. And this is ever evolving. So the way I uh, see it is that we have this capability of having a certain level of clarity on what we can prioritize, short term and long term, and being able to effectively uh, provide the resources needed, needed, considering that it is finite in nature. And uh, to uh, Jujit's uh, point, it is also a hub because of the uh, uh, how wide we can cover all these needs by the society. It's very wide. And uh, I guess uh, as we move along, uh, having more clarity on how we will do this and how we will transform this into more action-based uh, uh, action uh, uh, strategy is uh, something that you know, uh, we're really, really looking forward to. And uh, I saw Klaus uh, email last night, and yeah, it's about action. What can we do now in order to address these needs? But with all these vast needs that we have that we are facing, I think uh, uh, clarity is crucial. So we can really focus on what we can effectively handle as a group. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I have a suspicion that your laptop microphone and your ear, your earbud microphones are both somehow picking up sound, and that might be the reaper. But I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know. Yeah, but we can we can sort that out. Um, right. And and I wrote in the chat that a piece of OGM attacks the landscape's assumptions, um, by by which I by which I mean there's a thing about OGMing which is is trying to assume abundance mentality rather than scarcity mentality, and if we treat things right. If we treat one another right, if we treat the earth right, there is abundance of everything. There's plenty, plenty to feed everybody. We're just screwing up how we're doing everything. We're just terrible stewards of all these commons and all these assets that we share that keep us alive, like the food system. We're, we're, we're just, we, 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 a model for how to do it ate our brains that was based on sort of industrial scientific thinking. And then uh, it just ran the table for uh, a bunch of decades and led us to this really weird place we're in right now where we're endangering the planet. And I, <clears throat> there were two articles in my feed this morning, um, uh, which were about you know, how, we're, how we're, we basically catastrophically affected the natural, natural systems. So, um, Doug. That was faster than I thought. Um, as I'm listening, I feel a, a paradox between the metaphors of, let's say, the umbrella and the hub, and the idea of open. Uh, hubs and umbrellas are closed systems, or tending to closed systems. Uh, they're located. But open really implies uh, a welcoming permeability that has a different feel to me. So I'm just putting that out. Go ahead, Judy. Well, I just, I think we, I understand the importance of words, but part of what I grapple with is I see OGM as a process that embeds a lot of different dimensions. And so trying to capture it in a single noun is a bit challenging because I kind of use it as a verb, like we're OGMing X process, X event, X group, X trajectory. <laughs> and we're trying to apply best principles of both contextual knowledge, creation of new knowledge and dissemination and action based on knowledge. And that makes it really complex, but really rich and then adaptable by each component for that dimension which helps them the most. And I don't know if that makes sense, but that's... that's Doug, to your about. point, I think we can consider this as a stackable hub from the technical perspective. Uh, Pete, you want to jump in? And Romer, would you mind muting between uh, jumping in? Thanks. 
Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I mentioned it in chat. Um, I, I think one of the one of the things that resonates for me or doesn't resonate for me is uh, resonating is when we talk about how we OGM together as a verb and um, and when we when it feels like we're starting to talk about what is OGM and and how can we bound it then um, then it resonates less. I think for umbrella when when I hear umbrella or when I thought of umbrella um, and, and I think I got it from you Jerry um, but for me it it really is it it kind of conveys the the verb part of OGMing you know what what are all these different things doing together rather than how does the um, umbrella contain us um, so uh, I, I wanted to mention a couple other metaphory things that work for me I, I think we want to federate I think um, we need to figure out how federation works um, how things are loosely coupled um, uh, to use David Weinberger's phrase uh, small pieces loosely joined um, uh, another thing that that resonates for me is flotilla um, and I feel like that actually came from April on an OGM call but um, a, a bunch of when we describe hubs and umbrellas and you know sets of them it, it's more like it's not or you know a flock of birds or something like that you can see an outline of a thing but it's actually the rules and processes that that work between smaller groups uh, or individuals that that make the whole thing the thing so I, I i feel like we the the thing that we want to define mostly is how how the swarm works right how what are the rules of swarming rather than what the swarm is or how they can say in the swarm or so so then riffing on that a little bit i think also the one of the things that that's been tricky for me is thinking about the permeability the the membrane you know the the barrier between you're participating or you're not participating and i guess if we had rules for engagement for the flotilla or the swarm which kind of naturally um naturally included things that resonated with you know the purposes of the swarm um and kind of anti-resonated kind of pushed away things that that didn't fit into the swarm well um i think that's that's kind of a, a step in the right direction mm -hmm. um Years ago, after some conference, I bought the domain raftify.com uh, because three quarters of the Earth's surface is ocean. Why don't we learn to live on the ocean? And in order to do that well, we'd have to learn how to raft. And rafting is just the lashing together of a couple units, right? And and I think that's another sort of uh, metaphor here is that is that and, and these things are voluntary and temporary, and so the rafts can be reconfigured. Communities can move and and, and move move and evolve. Uh, once you start building up a whole surface area, then what you get is like floating islands. And, and if you ever want to have, lose a couple hours online, go look up floating gardens and floating islands in history. And uh, indigenous cultures around the world that, that did that in lakes uh, for, for, for raising food, super interesting, and for living on top of. Um, but I think there's lots of interesting metaphors here. Um, Klaus is asking in the chat uh, an interesting question that will take us in a different direction. What would a, what would a potential client for OGM look like? Who would benefit from its IP? Um, which we can go in, but I want to pause for a second because we have 20 minutes left in the call. I'd like to end at the top of the hour um, and see what's where, where we are. Like, what do we... Also, are we trying to prepare in some particular ways for the, the workshop? Is this specifically relevant to that? So sure. this is very specifically related to the workshop and we could spend some of our time puzzling through how best to build, for example, to build an emergent set of answers to the questions in Matt's workshop document as we even prepare some of our points of view about what to do up before, you know, before the 22nd, before the 29th. Because the whole design of the workshop is that we, we, we put opinions into this as we head into the workshop and then watch each other's opinions and then try to synthesize them uh, to bring them into something. So that will require some affordances. Uh, right now we've got a couple of Google Docs, right? Um, what, to, what, to, what might that look like? We could, we could go there. there. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling like this discussion so far is actually um, 
doing a nice job of turning the soil for the issues that we need to think about as we as we enter the workshop as well. So this this feels very fruitful to me for the workshop. And by the way, this is a home tree from Avatar, which feels like a reasonable context for what we're talking about. And George, I like your your Dali. <clears throat> um, other thoughts. I mean, one thing that would one thing that would catalyze our actions very quickly would be getting client work. And as I described before in, the, in yesterday's call, even there have been some efforts to get client work and to do things like that. One of those is likely to land and become a project that OGM has. <clears throat> and some of the projects like that might be completely amenable to open content, open everything. Uh, anybody come in and help, uh, some paid roles, I don't know exactly, you know, uh, we need to figure out how that would materialize. But others might be for a, a company that, you know, wants some kind of proprietary nature of its work. And I'm trying to figure out how to make sure that whatever gets created in any project like that becomes just part of the OGM infrastructure so that, <clears throat> so that if, if, we, if we brainstorm and create something for a financial services company, that that just becomes a part of the OGM platform where their, their own content becomes walled off as their content, but whatever we, we do to improve the platform makes it better, for example. But the, but the idea that um, multiple people in this community could be employed by projects that are building out the platform is really appealing to me, and I don't, I don't have an awful lot of conflict about that. John? Yeah, at the moment, it seems to me that OGM is the first client for what we're trying to do. Uh, we're the test bed and we're not there yet. Uh, uh, I mean, we haven't fully developed the technologies and the ways of relating and, and dealing with purpose and projects and all. So um, I just I'm thoughtful about the fact that we ourselves are incomplete as a uh, project. That's the whole goal of this workshop is to flesh out the things you just said. So that's I think I think that's we're heading into a into a bit of a vortex to try to get that done. Um, other thoughts? And then separately, what is the most productive thing we could do? Actually, other feedback on <clears throat> Matt's proposal for the workshop design. Uh, maybe if we focus there and offer some some improvements there. Or um, are you just comfortable with it? And uh, um, shall we head toward figuring out how to build work products around it? And I, I need to create a short video explainer and invitation to the OGM community <clears throat> for the workshop. So I will, I will be recording that and sending that, sending that out so that we know with a little bit more specificity what it is we're, we're looking to do. It just Charles. occurred to me, I'll, I'll chime in, um, in terms of the document, the main document, mission and structure, that's uh, got a lot of bullet points, it's a kind of laundry list. Um, it doesn't, sort of on, on uh, initial sort of scanning, it, it doesn't seem to be in a sequence too much, or maybe some of it's in a sequence. Um, so one thing is to, to put it in some kind of priority order or, or sequence flow. Um, but also to visualize it, maybe map it, um, or some kind of uh, vi visual layout that's not just a, a linear list. I think that would be really useful. Just occurred to me as a, a something very, very useful in advance of the workshop. Um, so you're talking, I think, about the one we were all collaboratively editing <clears throat> from the call like this one a while ago. And that one started with seven or eight questions I posed and those were headlines that used to sort of separate it. And now that everybody's piled a bunch of stuff in there, we've kind of lost the headlines. So an easy thing to do is to create an index for it and to label all the questions with a, you know, with a headline uh, tag or something like that. That'll at least make it more visible what this is. And the document was not meant to be an organizational structure, um, less than less that and more, let's, these are issues we need to talk about. Let's just talk about them here. And then George pointed out as he was commenting on a comment on a comment in that document, hey, uh, there's, we've lost a richness of communication here as we're sitting in comments in a Google Doc. Um, and and, and, and then, then I hit this frustration of, if only we had OGM already. Like if, all, if only the tech, technical sort of tactical, uh, useful things that we're aiming toward existed, 
we would be able to sort of spawn, spread, connect, and wander across these issues in a way that would be pretty useful. Um, alas, uh, we're still playing with Obsidian and the brain and uh, you know, Miro and stuff like that, all of which are, to my mind, kind of not, not quite exactly there. Um, I, I, I'd like to lean uh, into that. Sorry, sorry to yeah. take a little more time. Just, just, to, just to say, like on your last points about these different tools. So for me, one, one of my mantras is whatever works. And each of us has our sort of whatever works and our sweet spots of tools and tool combinations and, and workflow. But, but it, so to me, it's, it's less important. Like if it works, it works. But, but they, we have to work together. And so for me, it comes really down to responsiveness and follow through. And so, and, and this was also part of my conversation with Neil earlier, um, just one-on-one, -on -one, which is, you know, talking in, in for example, um, about a comment thread in a Google document where um, the lack of, of a response at the end of a thread, it, it basically becomes dead in the water, uh, effectively, uh, in, in my view. And maybe I could take a hard stance on that. But just as, this is one, one fresh example, but, um, um, so just to bring it bring it back um, back to the surface or zoom out to say you know whatever of those tools works again we have to connect them and for now we do use Google Docs and comments but but we have to have the follow through and whoever is holding the space or whoever sort of initiated the thread or the document or who's the space holder then there is a kind of ownership and maybe even a, a responsibility there. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be on one person, but there, you know, it, it can't be nobody. It can't be asleep at the wheel, you know? And so um, I hope that's clear enough and useful. Um, it sort of is, except I feel like really genuinely personally responsible for not being responsive and not following through on a lot of these things because it's, it's kind of on me to go follow up a lot of those things. And you said, here's a task for you. And I tried answering it. And then we're stuck in a corner on a comment on a Google Doc. And I, I lose the thread of all the things that are in front of me. So, so I, feel like, I feel like accepting the responsibility for doing the thing you just described, because you didn't, you didn't call me out. But, um, but I feel like it's me who has to do a lot of that stuff. And I feel kind of overwhelmed by the many things that I've helped bring into being. Uh, so I'm kind of kind of there. It is what it is, it, it, you know. I I'm not trying somewhere. to point the finger, but but uh, you know. And one one other thing I want to add, which is actually where I want to start from when I open my mouth, which is maybe to Pete in particular, but to anyone who's sort of energized by the idea or the actual practice of wikis, maybe we can actually put this whole thing into a wiki. It would be probably much more functional. That's an, a good conversation. Uh, I know a few people whose faces I'm seeing who've got deep experience with things like wikis. And, uh, and discourse has wiki-like aspects that I haven't quite understood. Yeah, kind of like is, is very light. Uh, Kevin, you've had your hand up patiently for a bit. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just, I think this group is really good at wandering and not very good at forging a path. And I think a space for collective wandering is valuable. Uh, so, you know, the assumption that this will become a, a, an engine of productivity is uh, possibly a, a flawed root notion. I have, I have a dog that needs to go out, so I'll, I'll hope that the things will be captured. But I got rugs, I got a dog, I got to go. That doesn't even sound metaphorical. That sounds very real. <laughs> um, and my hope is that the way we wander through this is that each of us who's, who's got side scanning radar and who's got projects and all that, we're like, oh, we have this problem to solve. There's a community over here that's built something that sort of does that, that's kind of an open source. We can drag that in, implement it, try it out with everything else. And then we have, uh, we have enough geek cred that we could adapt it, adopt it, blend it, integrate it with other sorts of things and turn it into or extend it into something else in which case we would be connecting to the community that developed that particular thing and bringing it in. So Pete then Klaus. Uh, Jerry, I wanted to go back to your, your thing where you felt like you didn't have enough time to do, you know, to spin up the things that you had helped spin up. Um, that, um, uh, that triggered my startup coach hat, um, my startup coach superpower. Um, and so that's, that's the answer to that is delegation, right? 
Um, so I don't think, I, so I think you don't need to find time to do those things. I think you need to find somebody to do them. Um, and that feels to me like an OGM federation kind of thing to do, right? As we grow and scale and evolve and things like that. Um, I, I think I think we'll start to see specializations. Um, at, you know, I, I can see myself specializing in providing communication tools, for instance. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe that's my, the thing that I do in OGM. Um, I think there is also a specialization. So I used to think of this, or we used to talk about this um, as a wiki gardening, wiki gardening team, um, something like that. Um, but, but maybe it's a little bit more, um, uh, I, when there's a wiki gardening team, there's a, a entity that that team serves kind of, but maybe it's a little bit more distributed and federated than that. So maybe there are people that need, you know, a, a, a set of people, a group that needs to do mm. something. And it, it yeah. may be, you know, there needs to be a few people who help discourse kind of form itself better, or there, there needs to be people who, you know, find, basically find the, 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 when, when you say, I feel bad because I'm not doing the thing I'm, I should be doing. Anyway, I, I guess that's where I'm wandering around that point. Um, it, it's, it's time to pick somebody and say, you get to do this. <laughs> um, so briefly before going to class, I just wanted to, to reply to that with a story I think I read from Derek Sivers, the founder of CD Baby, who's a really interesting guy to follow. <clears throat> and he said that, and I, I think this was about when they founded CD Baby, um, what they would do was periodically get, do, like do all hands while they were still small and they were figuring out how to do the thing they were doing. Like if this is a verb, not a noun, um, they would just say, okay, hold everything. And they would together talk through how, to, how a particular decision was, was happening. And then everybody could go back and go, oh, okay, that's how we address this sort of situation. And you, you, from, from many of these, you kind of learn how you work together and, and sort of the ethos of the enterprise. <clears throat> and I feel like we've set up in discourse, for example, places to have those conversations. And I haven't gone in and had those conversations. So I don't, I don't feel like enough of this is actually dissipated, disseminated so that we can sort of pick up and do that. And then there are very specific things like, hey, how do we organize better? Or how do we, <clears throat> how do we route humans into the places where they're probably gonna have the most satisfying conversation is totally a delegable task. <clears throat> and just asking for a volunteer for that is something that hadn't occurred to me. I'm a miserable delegator. So I appreciate you pointing that out. <clears throat> but I think we're also in that stage of trying to figure out what, you know, how we OGM, <clears throat> which I love. I love the idea that this is an emergent verb goal kind of kind of processing class yeah uh, linking in what what actually chair you started out saying and pete was emphasizing i see a hierarchy in narrative and that's what i was trying to express yesterday with what i have written down there you know so we started when, when you build a theme park you know a four billion dollar investment um you start with a story right disney's california adventure um, that story is being fleshed out. It's being uh, brought to a specific level of completion, you know, of, of, of uh, clarity. And then it's being passed on to a group of, 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 uh, of people who, who now go into specific directions, but always supporting the, the core story and in the process negotiating their way through uh, uh, the, the, the balancing act, right? So when I build restaurants, I got space allocations, but then I had to negotiate uh, with how much space I need for this particular type of restaurant. Sometimes I wouldn't get it. So I see that. And when you think about Don Donella Meadows, for example, right? The, the, the hierarchy of narrative, I think that's, that's what I was trying to get to. You know, what is our highest narrative and then how do we flow that story then down the pyramid and, and in where, where a practitioner like myself can grab it and, and run with it? Um, yes, love that. Um, we have three minutes left on this call. Um, closing thoughts. And I'd like to do, tell me if it's a bad idea, I'd like to do another couple of calls like this next week that are outside of the Thursday call because this, this is very helpful to me. 
Um, and I'm hoping, hoping it's helpful to you and to our process heading toward figuring out better how to OGM. So any closing thoughts for this call? No, I mean, Jerry, uh, I know I kind of came in as a lurker here, um, but I just kind of wanted to hear where people's heads were at on some of this stuff. And thanks for, thanks for putting this on. I know it sparked some, I feel like every time I come into one of these calls, I, it sparks some new thoughts or just articulations of how things should be. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think we just highlight, we all are kind of coming at this from like uh, similar, but slightly nuanced positions. Right. And so, um, you know, it, it's just great that we're having these conversations already. So that by the time we get to that bigger synthesis conversation, it just makes me feel a lot more confident that while we won't necessarily have specific answers for like certain questions that will at least know how to have the conversation or like start ha to have some of that stuff represented, which is um, heartening. And my hope is that six months down the road, for example, OGM has provided Klaus with like uh, ankle mounted rockets because he's able to do something and express something better. And a, a small crew, a subset of OGM members who are like, yes, we, we're, we're desperately on, on board with the food system being the most important crisis and, we, and helping him <clears throat> in, in ways that, that feed his projects and that feed their work and, and that we just lather, rinse, repeat in the different kinds of dimensions that Judy mentioned at the top of the call. <clears throat> and, and my goal is that OGM help each of us with our personal narrative journey goals target while building back how OGM works and making the platform better and so forth. And that's, <clears throat> it's a little hard to kind of figure out that that's not a conventional thing where we're gonna, we're gonna help publish artist music faster and pay them every two weeks, which is a great mission that CD Baby had. And that was like a much clearer mission than, than I think we've got here. Judy, you have the last word. And you're muted. There's sort of this, this progression from vision to action to outcome to repeat. <laughs> and huh. I think we have a global shared vision that's nascent, that's kind of emerging here. I think we have literally hundreds, if not more, action potential areas. And so that's going to be, and each action area has a shared value vision action sequence to go through. And so part of our process, I think, has to be how do we enable the process of, of ideation, action, execute, reevaluate, and repeat? Because I think that's the generative learning and growing process. And, and maybe if we think of ourselves as in addition to the knowledge repository and the skills repository, um, a leader in process thinking, a systems thinking model, that could be a very universal framework for us. I think that sounds like a great um, place to, to end this call. Um, I agree. Um, thank you all. Um, I'll put up a couple more calls like this for next week. And then uh, also I'll do the video introducing the workshop and, and what our kind of a assignments are, pre-work. And uh, thank you. This has been super, super, I feel like I'm, I feel like we're protecting home tree. Mm. Thanks everybody. <laughs>